Live from Toaster, this is John Gibbs with The Morning Break. You are listening live. Welcome to the Friday Break with John Gibbs. This week, in conversation with Dr. Richard Miller, Doctor of Philosophy, Blues Guitarist and Coach of Mixed Martial Arts, as we discuss an alternative way of thinking about schools and education. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or join in the conversation by downloading the Podbean app and following Teachers Talk Radio. Hashtag TT Radio. Welcome back. And my guest this week is Dr. Richard Miller, who's a friend and a colleague and someone whose career sheds an interesting light on education and the routes we might take. Richard is a doctor of philosophy, a coach of mixed martial arts and a very accomplished blues player on the guitar. And yet, Richard, I think, would I be right in saying you didn't have the most stellar career at school. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, no, that's fair enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I left at about 15. I think I had a GCSE in art. And yeah, the others were... Um, I didn't really engage too well with the school process, really. I, I'm dyslexic, which um, well, I'm 48 now. So, you know, back then it was... Um, I wouldn't say it was misdiagnosed, but I didn't... Well, I say it wasn't, wasn't diagnosed at all. People didn't really mention it much. But that definitely had on um, my education, yeah. I, I just wasn't one of those kids back then, I don't think, John, that was really into it at all, as, as we've experienced over the years. You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't for me then. Uh, so I left school and I ended up a, a labourer, a hod carrier, ground worker, you know, so it, it basically sort of, you know, dug, dug holes sort of thing. I, I was on holiday and met a guy that was, his name was John Tupper. So if you hear this, John, you know, thanks. Uh, it's just one of those chance encounters. I was, I was at a bar. We ended up chatting to him and um, he'd come over to do an MA in philosophy. He'd already, he was new, from New Zealand. He was working in a bar in London and he was doing an MA, I think it was at the London School of Economics. To cut a long story short, the interesting thing for me was I, I didn't know anything about philosophy at all. I'd kind of heard of it and knew it, it asked interesting questions, but I didn't really know anything about them. And, you know, over the course of a week or so, I got to know him. You know, he mentioned about the, the usual kind of suspects, you know, Descartes and this kind of thing. And I, and I just instantly found it fascinating, you know, just instantly interesting to me. I should say at this stage to our to our listeners that um, where we stand now, even though I've started with you, didn't have a stellar career at school. You left school at 15 with with a, with a GCSE in art. And uh, but where we but where we stand now, because on the other side of this career, you are you've got first class degree, you've got a, a PhD in philosophy. And then besides that, you're a coach of, of mixed martial arts with some success there as well. And yet it starts with a, did it, I mean, did it start with a chance encounter with a chap? It, yeah, it, it literally did. It literally did. You know, it was, it was a moment, chance encounter with the guy. I did try and, I did try and look him up afterwards, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't find him. Um, I, mean, I, I, I presume maybe I could if I looked online a bit more now. Things have moved on a bit since then but yeah it did I, I went back and I and I um I signed up to the Open University and um it wasn't even a course it wasn't even one of those they did they didn't do straight philosophy it was with uh with other, other sort of aspects but it was I, I ended up not doing philosophy sociology was a was was my first degree was it I ended up um going through the, I started off on a two year social sciences through that, but it, but the, the initial course was like, a, it was just an introduction to study. And I remember saying to my, my wife, Nick, you know, if I could just, I just want to finish it, read it, finish it. And, and where, where the OU are, are so good was in, was in the study skills. They teach you active reading. They teach you note taking. One of the first things you get given are exercises in how to actually study which we take as a given, but really, you know, I, I think my time, you know, for anyone listening, I, I don't, teach in schools anymore stopped a few years ago after 17 years of teaching you put in a reasonable stint as it were 
Um, but but I, but I feel like it's, it's, a, it's the same for, for a martial artist. You know, you can look at, so MMA, mix, mixed martial arts, is, is a mixture of different disciplines. So you leave school, but you're clearly have instantly fascinated by it, or you're fairly instantly fascinated by the idea of ideas. Yeah. By, by the thought of philosophy asking profound questions. So school didn't do that. No, uh, yeah, no, it didn't in the slightest at all, no. No, I hated it, I hated it. I went to school to see my friends and uh, and I was utterly unengaged with anything to do with school. I, you know, I don't think I was radically bad. I was one of those students that just didn't seem to um, want to be there. <laughs> We've all had them there, haven't we, at various times. And, and, and did no work, John, either. You know, I mean, that's the other thing that surprises me now. I look at, you know, I've got three children myself and the work they do, I, I literally did nothing. I, and it was one of those cases, I, I just went through the net, you know, slightly there. I, I was kind of a, a, low, a low level student, you know, I didn't do any work. I had no interest in it. I, I wasn't overly disruptive, I don't think. I think I was one of those sort of cheeky chappies. You know, I was up, up for a laugh, but I, I wasn't causing major mayhem anywhere. I just wasn't in any way, shape or form interested in, in anything. <laughs> so how did you feel? Frustrated, John, honestly. Angry, yeah. Yeah, well, exactly. A lot of people leave school with that feeling. And I have, I have a feeling that looking back on my teaching career, I have a disturbing sense that 30 odd years of teaching, and I'm not sure that it was always doing good. Yeah. I, I know if, if you imagined a column and you had to ask people to write in that column all the things they learned at school, they could fill it up fairly quickly. So I learned about mathematics and I did some history, learned about the Romans and I did this and so I did, I did. Then they might start putting qualifications. It's the actual things you learn, skills you learn. And then you say to them, well, what did you unlearn at school? And they would say, well, it's nonsense. They learn anything. Like they, it's, it's like pouring them. You know, pouring from a jug into a pot, they pour things into my head. And you say, well, but what they unlearned, they probably unlearned how, how to uh, draw. They learned they couldn't dance. They probably learned they weren't very, they learned that big ideas like philosophy were not for them. But I, I'll, I'll bet the balance is about half the students leave school un, unlearned more than they learned. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. Do you know, I mean, I just want to say just quickly, uh, there were some teachers though that I got on with very well and who I didn't forget. Stuart Renshaw, I think his name was, a PE teacher at Gilbert Inglefield School when I was there. He, he was just a brilliant guy, you know, really kind of um, encouraging, just a, a fantastic, I don't know if role model is the right word, because I didn't really see him in that eye, but I just, you know, you're just pleased to see somebody who was a kid, you know, he was, he was not strict in, in, a, in a kind of traditional sense, but you didn't, you weren't out of line with him. But I also think on reflection, he was, he was a very good, I think he was a cricketer or rugby, was he a rugby player? I can't remember. Um, really fit guy, really just, you know, everyone looked up to him and, and, and he was just a great guy. Miss Holt, as her name was, was a music teacher there. She was, um, she really inspired me as well. Uh, and, and, and do you know what? I mean, just inspired me just to like, you know, have a go on the ocarina. You know, have a go on this drum, you know, just have a go on stuff. What, what Richard, what, what is an ocarina? It's, it's a kind of round, uh, imagine a bull-shaped recorder made of clay. I will, I'll, I'll try and imagine that. <laughs> it was like that. I just remember that, I just remember them selling them to us, ocarinas, at the school. And about, yeah, it's funny you say that, I'd never thought of that. How did they do that? Because everyone ended up with these ocarinas. They must, they must have got a job lot cheap or something and. uh not that everyone had ocarinas that year, but it, it was, yeah, she was brilliant. I, I really got well with her. So I did have good relationships with someone. And this, is, this was in the middle school. I don't want to paint it like it was all negative experiences, my education. It wasn't, it was just, oh, God. No, so in case the, the teachers of Dr. Richard Miller, if you're out there, it wasn't all awful. But that's so, so true of so much of people's experience of school is that the they remember a trip or they remember an experience or they remember a personality. And often, I mean, we will tell you that something, something you said or some lessons you, let, you, let, you gave them changed the direction of their lives. And you think, well, it's quite, quite a profound experience, quite a profound responsibility. But in order to do that, John, I think you need some kind of, there has to be a level, there has to be some form of relationship there between student and teacher where one in which that allows that idea to flourish within that. I, th I think. Um, under certain conditions that you're never going to get that because there's a level of resentment. There's not the right environment there where, where you can allow ideas to work their magic, if you like. Traditionally, there's been within it's in martial arts, it's in philosophy, it's in the role of, of teaching. So there has to be a certain freedom there to cultivate that, I think. Where is the freedom to explore ideas critically? And that's the key point. I think students have to be allowed to bring their own experiences to critically engage with something that you give them and, 
and test it with the evidence that they have and find out if it has a meaning to them. Uh, and that's really when these ideas start to, to come alive. Well, they did for me anyway, you know. Those are some of the most profound skills that carry you through life and almost part of the invisible curriculum. They're there, they're there in a number of subjects. In fact, it almost doesn't matter what the subject is. It might, it might be English literature, philosophy, social science, or it might be mathematics, something that, that leaves you with that critical sense or inspiration towards learning. When did, when did mixed martial arts first start, or martial arts generally? I listened to a martial arts podcast the other day, and the guy was talking about, uh, the MMA one, he was talking about Anthony Robbins, the, the life guru. And he said, you, you can kind of summarize everything he does down into, find someone that does something that you want to do and copy them. And I think academia works very much like that, it, or it can do, and it, and it works well when it does. I think martial arts works well like that. I think, I think a lot, you know, Human beings work quite well like that. And, and for me, I guess as a kid, I was, I saw Enter the Dragon when I was, I don't know how old I was. I was a pretty hyperactive kid. So I wanted to go and do karate or kung fu. And my parents were like, no way, you, you're not, we're not having you kicking and punching anything. You know, <laughs> I don't know what I was. I must have been about six or seven or something. But I had to wait. And in the end, they got me into judo. So um, on reflection and the way MMA went, it, was, it wasn't a bad place to start, to be honest. But I started in judo when I think I was eight or nine. It was really good. You know, I loved it. And then I moved on to... It was, it was a form of kickboxing. So you box with your hands and the kicks were sort of primarily sort of karate style kicks uh, and you kick waist above and, and the competitions were, you'd, you'd have a number of competitions in a day, same as the judo ones were like that. And, and the competitions were, were good for me because I, I was, you know, truth be told, I was terrified. <laughs> uh, yeah, so then, and then I, I ended up meeting a guy that had trained with a Thai. He, he taught a variety of martial arts, but he'd actually trained Muay Thai with a, with a, with, a, with a Thai in Thailand, and, and, I, and then I trained with him for a few years, and then off with another, left him, went to another uh, to a pure Muay Thai gym, uh, and and trained. So I got, I went from sort of kickboxing to to Thai boxing, which um, for those listening that, that aren't aware the relationship there, Muay Thai is is a is, is a form, it's a, it's a martial art in and of itself. It's a discipline from Thailand. It's a form of kickboxing. So now what is the mix in mixed martial arts? What, what... So, yeah, so just moving on to that first, because this, this was all long before mixed martial arts. I, I did that for a number of years. And then I probably stopped that when I was about 25. Um, around this kind of time that I start, I, I met this guy and got into academia. But, I mean, I ended up joining a Brazilian jiu-jitsu gym. And that's so that's ground fighting. So I'd left Thai boxing. I ended up... Um, doing the striking so mixed martial arts is a combination of these martial arts so probably i was probably late 20s uh ended up it was and it was in its infancy in the uk then really there weren't many places doing it i i ended up going to a gym where it was primarily then ground-based uh and meeting the grapplers and, and training in brazilian jiu-jitsu and they were doing mma as well in competition so you could do competitions as pure grappling which was brazilian jiu-jitsu in, in a gi in a suit then you could do what's called nogi, which was without the the suit, which is just like shorts and t-shirt. You 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 grapple like that, and then they did uh, MMA, which was with striking as well. And obviously that starts standing. So um, I'd had this experience in these different sort of kickboxing and, and, and muay thai areas, which I kind of let I put behind me then, but ended up this one gym I was at. They were they were they were pretty good, you know. Um, you know uh, there was some pretty decent pro fighters there. And I ended up sort of helping a, a few out with some sort of clinch positions and some elbows and knees and bits. And and then slowly kind of that, I went to another gym um, and started doing, um, teaching their, their MMA guys just stand up striking, which was which is a kind of draws from Muay Thai, but has also the boxing footwork and boxing hands. So it was just, a, again, you're mixing up different parts of these martial arts and, and the beauty of MMA, which I've, I've kept me interested for so long, Again, I didn't intend to be an MMA coach. It's just something that's just I've really enjoyed and kept other things going and just enjoyed it, really. Is it evolves all the time. The sport, if you watch it, what, what, what was MMA looked like 15 years ago was different to 10 years ago, different to five years ago, and it's changing again now. It's become its own system, if you like, almost, because it draws from the different systems or, or different martial arts, the bits that are most effective. And, and, and not, all, not all are effective for all people all the time. You know, I want to say that you know you do get specialists, and you do get 
various people who will gravitate towards one area over others. But I think that's a kind of summary of my relationship with it anyway. You're listening to The Friday Break with John Gibbs and my guest, Dr. Richard Miller, as we reflect on learning through music, mixed martial arts and philosophy. When the first ever I heard, there's a thing that people do called cage fighting. Well, I just imagined, as I said to you yesterday, people thrown into a cage, and and the one who's the one who's still alive after half an hour comes out again. And there was no structure to it or anything of that kind. But of course, actually, what you what I've learned from you, it is a it's a martial art, and there is there's an emphasis on the word art. There's a technique to it, as with all arts, as a skill you can learn. That you, you know, uh, so it's highly technical. I think I've always in, I've always liked things that move and change, um, that aren't static, and and it's really you say about it. Yeah, it's a technical game of chess. I've enjoyed grappling over the years immensely. I mean, they're so technical; it's phenomenal. Like likewise, some of the the, the, the stand-up guys are just uh, amazing now, and the skill level is it's it's it is compared to what it was twenty years ago, it's phenomenal. And I wonder what it'd be like in another twenty years. You know, it's it's, it's incredible. And you're you're a strike coach. Yeah, striking. So it's just the kick, kicking. So that's, that's, uh, yeah. So, I mean, look, on, on the higher end guys that I would do, um, just, just the striking part. So the kicking, punching, the kneeing, the elbow and, and elements of the clinch. I wouldn't call myself a, a complete MMA coach. There are head coaches who, who do everything, who, who, who will teach all aspects of it. I've kind of stayed in that lane because it's one I know I'm comfortable with and I'm, I kind of specialise in that area. That's what people come to me for. It's just that, that that one area. So when you see the fights start and they're standing up and they're moving around and they're fainting and they've got footwork and their heads are moving a certain way and their hands are in a certain place and the job then for the striker is either to, to use the cage wall to get back up again or not or get held down and, and then lose. So my area is just really the, the, the move about standing area. As well as that, I want to say that I did... You know, I taught quite a long time. Uh, uh, my friend owns a, a, a Muay Thai gym, or did. It's, it's shut through COVID, unfortunately. But we ran a very successful Muay Thai kids program. And, and that that was just stand up. So it's its own martial art, um, as opposed to something like the MMA, where it's just you're, you're blending different bits and pieces together there. So when you first encounter martial arts, you're, you're going onto a gym while you're working. He's going out there in the evening and so on. Or, or, or when you're free, free time, you're going to a gym and so on. Now you're a coach. Who who are the who are the young people, guys, women, possibly, who come through the door that you encounter? Uh, I, I would say all sorts, John. Really, you know, it, the great thing about the sport is it really it's got something for everyone. Whether or not everyone becomes a great fighter, there, there's a lot of components and moving parts really for that. But in demographic terms, I mean, is it mostly it's mostly young men? Primarily, yeah. Primarily young men. Um, but you do get older people that come through and, and want levels of fitness. You also get, uh, you know, MMA has embraced um, uh, w- uh, female fighters as well. You know, the, the, the highest level at the UFC, there are always girl fights uh, fighting on there. And, and, you know, there are some fantastic champions. One fighter, Saty, actually, Shevchenko, she, I mean, she's an absolutely amazing um, fighter. And so there, there are, yeah, there, there are. You've got a sort of modern. It's, it's a very, it's a very contemporary sport because it's only, it only came about in the early nineties, and it's largely a child of the internet. You know, it kind of was born out of social media, and well, no, before social media, sort of chat rooms and and, and this kind of thing. It was, it kind of moved through through those ranks. Where I'm going with this, in a way, is that it was. It, I don't know the first time I heard that boys were failing at school and girls were getting better and better. But now girls outperform boys at every aspect of, of schooling and, for, and higher education. And lots of young men leave school with poor experiences and having unlearned more than they've learned. And you were telling me, I think you, you characterised that much of the way in which you got back into academia, studying, 
you use disciplinary techniques of the disciplinary lessons rather of the gym of 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 mixed martial arts of martial arts definitely definitely because what i did i looked at this open university course and and i, I knew you know I, that, that i wanted to do it and it was and i wanted to complete it and i knew i was working how many hours a week you know, and I knew I had time in the morning, I had time at night. And very much like you prepare a guy for a fight. And I, by the way, I didn't do this consciously at the time. It was just my mind worked like that. I now realize because of years of, of, of you know, years of training. But it was, I, I wrote down in the morning, you know, I, I woke up and tried to do my active reading in the morning before work. Sat there and tried to do the stuff that they tell you to do, you know, write it down in your own words. Then I would go to work, come back and I would read through it and then try and summarise again in my own words, and then read the original article again and see if it made more, it made more sense. Kind of almost set, uh, set a timetable up, which is it, it's exactly what you do in MMA now. When I was training a lot, you know, that, that was how we did things. I had a training partner or partners. We would meet up at various points in the week, uh, and we would, whether or not it was in gyms or whether or not it was, a lot of friends with garages, one specific friend with a garage, we'd go there, and we'd never miss a session. You know, and we would have our runs, through there we would have our bag work pad work uh we'd have technical work we'd work through stuff there and we'd just keep going just rep a martial artist life is about repetition it's just drill 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 over and over again and and academia is exactly the same you know that's that's how i went at that then so it's and and, and there's another key thing i thought about this you know the idea of motivation you see a lot of people talk about motivated being motivated that that that's utterly against the ethos of martial arts i think you, you don't want to be motivated. You want to be self-disciplined. If you have discipline, you don't need motivation. The discipline of martial arts is to carry on doing something when you don't want to do it. You know, success in academia, for me, is that. Well, that's a fantastic lesson, because I think so much of our culture, I'm going to sound like an old fogey now, but I'm in my 60s, well into my 60s now, so get my get my state pension this year, so, hey, you know. So I can I can I'm allowed to say stuff like this that I think our culture does produce um, a sense in which if you want something if you will something if you're motivated to go for it culture you know that if you go for it then somehow success will follow but simply like, simply like desiring that thing and desire will produce success well clearly you desire but the desire has to result in the relentless repetitious disciplined application over time. Yes. Put the work in, and, and and you have to be almost detached from that. I mean, that's something that stoicism teaches you, isn't it? You know, happiness is 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 largely by you know recognizing things in your control and things that aren't in your control. It's it's organizing your time in such a way that you can commit to a thing, whether or not it's you want to be a martial arts guy, you want to be a Thai boxer, or a MMA fighter, or or you want to do well in academia. Or be a good student. What, you know what? It's exactly the same. You, you set a framework out and you stick to it. You don't worry about if you're feeling motivated or not. That doesn't. Don't, don't worry about that. You just get on with it. I watched, like many a middle class parent, I watched my elder daughter learn the violin. Well, there's literally years of the most appalling noise, <laughs> you know, and repetition, 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 learning technique, technique until it becomes muscle memory and second nature and all those things that have, that is embedded in now years of years of effort and all sorts of moments when she might have given up and not done it. And we weren't, we weren't, I wasn't, like a, we weren't like tiger parents of so, get to your violin lessons. You must do your two hours. But if she was enjoying it, she did it. If she didn't enjoy it, you know, uh, that was fine. And she, she enjoyed the incremental, very, very incremental process of learning. I mean, so it's that, that sense in which, and I think anyone who's completed a, an OU degree, because that OU is, you know, you've got to do it before you go to work. You've got to do it when you come home from work. You've got to do it in your lunch hour. You've got to do it. This, there isn't the sort of timetable of get to the lecture and get to the lesson. So in martial arts, you break down an MMA fight. I was sort of look at a fighter or, or look at look at the sport, which, you know, tactical, technical athleticism you know these are these are the three areas that you break something down to you know it's it, success is largely a combination of those things you know um the athleticism is obviously what it what, what it means you know it's the strength and conditioning you you all the other parts that the, the physicality of the, the person for their weight because they're they're on a certain weight they're 
and then the other aspects are is technical so what techniques do they have how much of these repetitions have they put down this kind of thing and then you've got tactical you know how is that how are those techniques and that and that athleticism applied in a tactical sense what's the game plan going into whatever you're going to do and and, and does the guy stick to it i think that academia is exactly the same and where where the ou is so strong and and good teaching i think practice as well within a, a school or a university is the ability to teach both of those things you you need the, the study skills are the key and you need you also need a, a, a kind of st- st- a strategy you need some way in which to implement those so for me the bit i took from 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 you know what i realized now was was being able to put it into a framework you know where i would do it relentlessly no matter what you know i would just and when i did the phd it was the same like writing up day was friday because I'd, I'd managed to get a, a day off on the friday so regardless you know hung over or whatever else it was you know friday was still i sat there and words had to come out <laughs> they didn't <laughs> Sometimes nothing would, but again, it's that it's that it's that self discipline, isn't it? What's well, that thing about they say? What, what is the difference between writers and people who want to be writers? Well, the writers write. That's the difference. They actually do sit down and write, as opposed to the would-be writer who thinks they might get into it one day. Friday morning break with John Gibbs and my guest this week, Dr. Richard Miller, as we discuss learning through music, mixed martial arts and philosophy. Join us again after the news. to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The iNews website covers the issue of vaping in schools. Whilst vaping is thought to have helped many adults kick their unhealthy smoking habits, the rise in straight to vaping in young people and children rings alarm bells for many. The report focuses on concerns expressed by teachers about angsty pupils struggling with the wait for their next fix. Vapors making school toilets frightening places as they gather in groups, increases in internal truancy and worries it may lead to pupils experimenting with stronger substances. Some schools have made significant changes to toilets to include sophisticated sensors which set off an alarm when e-cigarettes are used whilst others have increased numbers of staff on duty in corridors to deter pupils from skipping lessons in order to vape. Many schools have also invited police and health specialists in to talk about vaping in a bid to educate pupils on the dangers. Many schools across the UK now ban vapes, treating them like other banned items such as drugs and knives. This is prompting suspensions and other high-level sanctions in a bid to remove them from schools. England's Chief Medical Officer, Professor Sir Chris Whitty, said last week that the number of children vaping was appalling and heavily criticised companies which produced them in flavours such as green gummy bear and watermelon bubblegum. The bright colours, shapes reminiscent of highlighter pens and the low cost of around £5 making them attractive to youngsters with pocket money to spare, which Whitty described as utterly unacceptable. The proportion of 11 to 17 year olds who say they have tried vaping rose from 14% to 16% in 2022, according to a YouGov survey, 
with a percentage of children who regularly vape doubling in the same time period. The article also features references to Teachers Talk Radio's Tom Rogers tweet asking how much of a problem vaping was for schools, with many replies indicating it is a serious cause for concern. Full details of the article are available online. In related news, many media outlets have been reporting on so-called school protests, which seem to be focused on toilets and the right to use them as a key issue. According to multiple stories, pupils have been encouraged to protest about rules focused on restricting free access to toilets by posts on social media platforms such as TikTok. The majority of the schools affected make it clear that rules around access to toilets are made for safeguarding purposes, designed to protect all pupils and to minimise bullying, vaping and other antisocial behaviours. The Evening Standard reports that a quarter of UK student gamblers may be experiencing harm whilst half said betting had affected their university experience. The survey of over 2,000 students at UK universities was conducted in December. It found that 71% of the respondents had gambled in the last 12 months, with 24% exhibiting problem gambling behaviour. Of the students who said gambling had had an impact on their experiences at university, 13% said they'd had trouble paying for food, 10% had missed lectures and 9% struggled to pay bills. A third of student gamblers said they spent between £11 to £20 per week, with 13% admitting to a spend of between £50 and £100 per week. Only 55% of those surveyed were aware that support for them was available through their universities. Full details of the report are due at the end of February. Finally, Aberdeen Live reports on a project led by the University of Aberdeen, which has led to a successful trial of a new approach to teaching which is helping improve adult literacy in Rwanda. The project adapted the existing adult educational curriculum to better develop relevant knowledge and skills which can be applied in students' daily lives. These techniques included role play, group activities, case studies and problem solving. Previously, only 14% of those pursuing an adult learning course felt they had gained the skills they needed, with 66% still unable to read and 76% unable to write by the end of the course. The new method showed improvements in multiple areas, with adults retaining their knowledge and skills, which were linked to nutrition and hygiene, improved household income, animal husbandry and becoming community leaders. The project was funded by the Scottish Government. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Was it you tell me also that when that when a when a fighter goes into the fight that in, in essence the first punch they get in the face they're going to forget all their tra- it, their training it's going to be it's going to be uh, from that from that moment onwards it's basically conscious or it's unconscious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I've said that to you. I mean, it's not that definitely happens. I mean, it's it's just and and I think I think it's that what what I love about. MMA and and I, I put in this like judo, jiu-jitsu, boxing, Muay Thai, kickboxing. You know anyone that's done any of these things. You know you you have my respect because it's not easy. They're very difficult. They're very stressful. They can be immensely j- enjoyable and heartbreaking and and just tough. Just very very tough. And I think it's experiencing that toughness of that difficulty that that gives you the the, the discipline that I'm talking about. The, the the self-discipline i mean personally i'm i, I wouldn't call myself a self-disciplined person in the slightest but in, in in those specific areas i have been i think largely because of that and and so you know when i've said to you before at those in in the past that you, you can do everything that's supposed to happen and it takes time for them to settle into a situation where they can use the skills they've got you know it, it just all goes out the window in the amateurs very much not always not always some guys it doesn't you get some real some real naturals that just are just listen and, and they're just there and they're they're very present they're in a the moment and they and everything just flows you get paralysis by analysis you get some guys that are awesomely awesome technically but 
freeze and can't get it going. And, and then, and it, for those guys, it just takes a bit longer. It's just time. Again, it's that um, discipline to continue going. Don't worry about the outcome, the winning or the losing. Just, just carry on, carry on going. You know, it's a process, and just keep, keep at it. And do you see? Do you see the experience you had, the the, the discipline of martial arts? is beneficial to some of the guys you come across oh god yeah yeah definitely i mean i i mean I, I, at so at so many levels and i've met so many guys who have who have explored around the essence of martial arts and become interested in psychology i've seen it give meaning it, it shapes especially mma and especially at the higher levels you can't really do a lot else i mean you you, you, you can people do work full-time jobs but it, it's 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 so demanding of these guys' time that it it gives I think a meaning an identity which is really important that they they identify themselves as their fighters their MMA fighters and and this is what they do and they work really hard at it it's it's a very very demanding sport. There is a sort there is some some sort of synergy between discipline and between thinking about the world in a in a broader sense. Very much so. Very much so. In a sense, to be to be completely, to break the cliche of the guys who go to the gym are not the guys you're going to have a, a conversation with about uh, about life, morality, ethics, how to how to live the good life, or anything of those kinds. The life of a of a modern day mixed martial artist or somebody who wants to to be involved in that life, it kind of answers all of those questions because. You do have a meaning. You do have a purpose. You, you're gaining so many more skills that that you're not even these that, that a young martial artist isn't even aware of that they're getting. Like I say, they're, they're transferable skills. You get someone that's very good at that's trained hard in MMA and and, and continues to do to, to do so. I'm, I keep referencing MMA, but really any any of these. I say the contact martial arts because there's there's a huge difference between. Competing as a kickboxer or a, or a jiu-jitsu fighter or anything else, and, and then doing then doing some martial art that with with no contact at all, because you you I think you need there's something about pushing yourself against another human being, struggling, inspiring. Even if you're not a competitive um, martial artist, but you're you know if you you go to a jiu-jitsu mat, put on that gi, and go on those mats, and you know it's a humbling experience the first time you do it. It's very addictive. It's exhausting. It's immensely rewarding, and you learn so much about yourself. I think it would radically transform education if, if these kinds of programs were were available for, for everyone. What we teach in the schools, the su- the subjects we teach, have largely arrived through accident. They're the result of nineteenth century ideas about, or, or even earlier ideas about what what how you divide up intellectual pursuits into things which have arrived and are generally pursued by people who themselves have pursued those subjects and have a an identity attached to them so you, you teach the, the maths you learned yourself and you teach the history you learned yourself because that's what young people should learn because that's what you learned and there's a there's a momentum in teaching which is often not questioned and there's certainly momentum in the structure of schools they are that way because they are that way so so I don't think it's absurd. I think it's a thing we should really do is ask why we teach what we teach. Doesn't it draw even more fundamental questions though, about you know why we teach? What? I think there's a big, bigger question mark on over, over the. What are you trying to achieve from an education? Training someone to pass an exam is not necessarily educating them. That was what I saw change. I went from what I felt was teaching to being required to facilitate a syllabus. And both the teaching and the students it became very instrumental. It was just like a list of checklists. The, the critical aspects, which I think are the most important parts, were all removed. If you extracted the amount of time you spend teaching students the techniques of success within examinations, which are themselves highly arbitrary and arrived, arrived. we've talked in the past about the, the arrival in, in academia of the, of the structured essay and the timed exam. It sort, of, it sort of happens as, a, as an accident, as an idea about what intellectual pursuit is. And also a, 
a tendency to think rather disparagingly about physical activity. I mean, I know that, the, you know, from, from the Greeks onwards, the, the, the body, I mean, we were talking the other day about Roman, the Roman gymnasium and the Roman baths and so on, how side by side the library, the library was attached to the gymnasium, something I learned recently on a trip to Rome, is that intellectual pursuit and physical pursuit went side by side in the classical world. And, and, that, that, and you might say, well, they do in school today, you know, there's the PE lesson and so forth. But very much a bias towards being in that exam room, a hierarchy of knowledge which emphasises examinable outcomes produced through academic study in very strict ways of, of assessing those. So those, those become assessed through mechanisms that become themselves the means of study. So you study the mechanisms of, of passing the exam. And as you say, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think one of the things I noticed over the years in teaching was how instrumental the whole process became. And sometimes to the detriment of the love of learning. So let's go back to, so there you are, Richard. This is your, this is your life. So you're, you're, you're into MMA and uh, you, you're doing your, your, your sociology degree at the OU. Uh, but philosophy, because that, that's where me and you overlap, because we do a podcast, the Spinoza Triad podcast, the very successful Spinoza Triad podcast, that his audience is growing almost exponentially in the last, in the last few episodes. When we, when we discuss philosophy. And I think the principle of our philosophy discussions have always been that, that you shouldn't be afraid to discuss big ideas. Don't be afraid. Don't be, let, never let your ignorance put you off any discussion. <laughs> never let ignorance stand in your way of pretending to know stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the end point that was, where did, where did philosophy start for you? So as a strand within the social sciences and, and sociology, there, it has, as most subjects do, a deeply philosophical underpinning from a largely epistemological through the social science has to ask the question of how you know what you know. So I never really left it in that sense. I was always interested in the more philosophical areas of, of the social sciences. I, I ended up reading quite a bit of Foucault's stuff, so around discourse, language, power, which touched around Nietzsche and, and then Obviously, with sociology, you have Marx and you have the, the idea of ideology. The concept of ideology itself is a fascinating concept that can you know, keep you busy for a few years if you, if you go down that, that kind of rabbit hole. So it was never really, it never really left. You know, when you start off in these, in these areas, it's like the, there is, there's a kind of, just like there is in, in martial arts, there are, there are uh, lineages. You get the same in academia. You know, you, get, you can trace the different thoughts, if you like, that go back. You know, most roads obviously go back to sort of the Greek period, but a lot of the, I was interested in the sort of contemporary, more modern philosophy then. And then, then I went back back to um, it was it was largely I think after I'd finished the PhD really that, that I got really back into the, the sort of classical philosophy stuff because the thing when you do a PhD is you, you you know a hell of a lot about one small area. All of your time is is, is spent on that one area, and you become very immersed in it. Um, my, mine was on belief, so it was, it was around. I, I still find interesting now, and that, that was another thing I'd say, John, as well. You know, I, I think the thing about martial arts, which which is good, is people are interested in it. Likewise, I think when you're studying something, it's not what subjects should you do; it's what subjects do you find interesting. <laughs> Forget what you should do. You know, it's that added, isn't it? Find something you enjoy doing, and never work another day. And, and, and I really feel like for me, studying was that. Uh, it's never been a chore. I don't want it to sound like I'm this self-disciplined guy that just, no, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the reading. I enjoyed finding out new stuff that I didn't know before. And, I, and you know what I still, I still do now, which is largely what our podcast is, isn't it, really? I think of my, my father, very typical of a lot of men in his generation of the 1930s, besides, besides the interruption of the Second World War and all that stuff, but he finished school before the Second World War. And he left school with no, no qualifications at all. But that was, that was very common for working class lads in those days but he always had this sort of um well he was an autodidact really he just read and read and read and read and read stuff and taught stuff and learned stuff and taught so he taught himself to become an engineer taught, taught himself to dis disassemble that radios and put them back together again electricity and so on and be became very successful because he had a desire to learn and i was talking to a guest a few weeks ago who, she'd done a study a phd on the on the finnish education system and they said, well, you can't necessarily just say the Finnish education system, one of the most successful in the world. If you simply said, well, let's do what they do then. Let's simply take their education system and do that. Won't we be successful? Well, no, because in, the, in, in essence, because of all sorts of historical and cultural things, 
that have happened to the Finns, occupation by the Russians, a sense of constant threat from from uh, enemies, a, a relatively recent sense of wanting to identify themselves as different to being Swedish, meant that Finns have an in, a cultural bias towards wanting to self-improve. It won't be an uncommon experience for teachers to go into a class in this country and find that the that students have learned, especially by secondary school, they've learned how to not learn and they've learned the things they can't learn. I actually think there's a, an innate thing within most people as teachers and within you know, young people or wherever, wherever age you are, people do want to know more and, and they do want that. The reality is the teacher goes into the classroom, they're overworked, they've got so much to do, they've got so many students to look at it's it's literally impossible to do the job at a, a level of which you're you're talking about there or it's should i say it's extremely difficult for, for most teachers it's almost an impossible job for, for the way in which we're discussing it now for that to be able to work efficiently because you've, you've ended up with a kind of quantitative numbers game rather than ideas and critical thinking but also one of the other things i, no- I noticed over the years especially was was the annihilation of music. How I watched I watched a vibrant music service impoverished impoverished of funding and then just then virtually destroyed. It became it became so middle class parents who had the resources to provide violin lessons for their kids, that was fine. But a broad learning of music, you know, working working class lads could sit in a bedroom and pick out chords on a guitar. That'd be fine. You could still do that. But essentially Music as a subject was was utterly gutted during the years uh, uh, of, of, of teaching. So let's talk about that other thread, Richard, of your of your ability, the guitar and the steel guitar and blues guitar. Where did that start? Yeah, when I was young, I, I was I was very very lucky to have a a dad who was a big Muddy Waters fan. It kind of my earliest memories, whereas. Purple Cortina with the, the eight track they have in them we had before tapes even, and it had the muddy waters. And I just remember hearing it was uh, Catfish Blues was the track. I, I, I obviously know it quite well now, but I, I, I distinctly remember. You know, it was one of my earliest memories was that track, and it was just I don't know. It was, again, it was a bit like with the philosophy thing. I just struck it. <laughs> should I yes, use the, the pun? It struck a chord. Uh, <laughs> That was awful, wasn't it? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I, I ended up. Um, it's not a dissimilar journey to the martial arts one. They've had similar kind of waiting, probably more so uh, with the guitar over the years. The steel guitar was was something that I just. Um, it was weird. I had never any desire to teach it or anything else. I'm not a coach or anything. I, I taught my son. That was it, and, and he took from it what he wanted and it moved in his own direction. I, I, so pr- primarily, I just want to state, you know, I wasn't rocking the main stage of Glastonbury. It was primarily background music in weddings and uh, restaurants and stuff. I, I play, uh, I play, I, I ended up playing and still do now, um, sort of 1930s s- steel resonator guitars. If you see the old metal ones with the paint chipped off them sort of thing, that, that, and play, I play with a bottleneck or slide, both upright slide and, and lap slide. So that's uh, that's really my niche, just like the niche thing with the, with the striker, I suppose. You're listening to The Friday Break with John Gibbs and my guest, Dr. Richard Miller, as we reflect on learning through music, mixed martial arts and philosophy. I suspect, and this is going to sound like a completely facetious observation, 
you know, this is like, you know, you're saying stuff, but I don't mind. Is that if you had a school and in an imaginary world, parallel universe, and that school's curriculum was martial arts, music, and philosophy. Say, so, well, okay, for secondary school. You say, well, don't worry about the mathematics and the, and the reading and writing, because they've, they've learned as much literacy by the time they're 11, these students, as they're ever going to need in life. And that's actually true. Like most people have learned all the maths they'll ever need in life by the time they're about 11. And if they need to become engineers and architects, they can do that afterwards and study that. But they'll leave school with music, martial arts, and philosophy. And you think, well, I, said, I, I, just, I just suspect that you say, well, that's crazy. It's ridiculous. Who'd send kids to, that, to a school like that? Such a narrow curriculum. But I, th- I think it would be a very broad curriculum. And I think, that, I think that society, I think it would actually work quite well. And I don't, and I don't mean that as simply a, a jest or a thought experiment. I think it probably would work as well, if not better, than a system we've got now, which often, I think, narrows and de-teaches and unteaches. I mean, there is, John, there is, there is, and I could, I could, I think, I think that if you said like music, philosophy is in, there's an enjoyment with all of these things. And then there's the actual becoming better at something or, or, or in enjoying it. I think I go back to that thing of like, people like to be good at something. You, you said about what must life would look like at school. I was frustrated because I, I think I wasn't very good at anything. Not really. I, I kind of been mucking about with guitar then. And I'd been, I was already Thai boxing quite a lot by the time I left. So my identity was kind of in, in that. And I, I was getting good at that. I mean, Thai boxing, I was doing most evenings by then. But I think the thread there, the relationship with them is, is it's, I think people, people like to get good at something just for themselves. It's just rewarding to put practice into something and get better at it. So I think music, philosophy, martial arts, you know, any of these, any of these kinds of things that you want to do, uh, you'll you'll get better at them the more you do them. There are more efficient ways to spend your time, technically. Again, we go back to that because there are technical things on a guitar that you do or don't do or understandings of it. There are also tactical ways of approaching it. You know, um, endlessly jamming as much as enjoyable as it is, and which is something I do. You know, I, I do a lot of. Isn't probably as efficient a way of spending your time than than, than maybe you need time. I mean, there would be. I would imagine ways of, of spending time like that that would give you more a better outcome, if you like, for the time you spend it. But unfortunately, John, I also think that, like you know, we've, we've picked on philosophy, martial arts, and, and and but I think any discipline, really, you know, if you allowed an English teacher to teach English, if you allowed, you know, a scientist to teach science, you know, if you allowed a historian to teach history, and just allowed them to to to, to bring those aspects to the table I, I feel that, that it all does the same and it all offers the same it gives somebody the chance to to really get their teeth into something and, and get better at it and really you know enjoy it you know and, and get and, and find a sort of meaning in that well plato thought geometry was the key to everything that, that before you even start asking questions about ethics or epistemology or, or, um, or ontology or anything, questions of that kind, start with ge- geometry. <laughs> yeah. Get your angles sorted not, out. Not for me. <laughs> not for me. <laughs> yeah, okay. No, I don't, yeah. Yeah, don't send me to that school. Richard, we were talking about the relationship between philosophy, if there is a relationship between philosophy, and and uh, and martial arts. Mm, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think there are there are a number of crossovers there, but I mean, I, the one that springs to mind really um, is this idea of a flow state, and, I, and I'll bring music in there as well. I mean, only because these are the areas I know about. I, 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 I would imagine anyone listening to this that's proficient in in, in anything they do would probably, you know draw a similar kind of a, a analogy here but the the idea of a flow state when you're under high stress in in in, uh, in, in competition you know whether or not that be mma or, or, or jiu-jitsu or, or whatever the, the whatever the athlete's doing you, you you kind of want you want the athlete in this flow state where time starts to be affected and 
and really the this kind of the person's skills hopefully can can express themselves it's very much like being on stage with a guitar where you are improvising and you're playing you, you enter into this kind of flow state really where you're not really in control of anything it's it's just you're you're in this kind of state much like i remember um you know the finals of a degree or or or, or, or when you're studying if you're writing something you've got you know you've got a, uh, an article or a dissertation or something to do you know you the time shifts and changes you're you're literally in that moment uh, and and i think that that's something that all of these have a crossover with uh, and I, and i don't I, like i said I'm, I'm talking about those areas because they're the ones i do i know a bit about but i, I imagine do you not think it's could be crossed over to i don't know cycling or 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 or, or a poet writing something or an artist looking at a... yeah i think i think the creative process uh that sense in which people say where did that idea come from where where the, that that uh, that you don't know the you don't know what the end of your sentence is going to be until you've said it so that you can actually surprise yourself by your own thought or idea is is uh an i is is the way in which the, the the you know the brain the brain works this this magnificent and extraordinary thing of human consciousness which seems to be able to produce um something from magic no wonder the under the greeks had an idea of the muses and being touched by a muse and being able to be where, where it came from outside that's that odd sense that i didn't initiate that idea of course i did yeah i mean john that's an interesting i mean what, what you're saying now about the techniques of things there that's something that you know i need to reiterate that because uh it's you know i've talked a lot about technique and and technical and tactical kind of you know approaches to that and it, this sounds very instrumental but that's you, you learn a technique in order to forget a technique. You know, when, when I play a guitar, the right hand technique I have, I, I learned years ago, you know, I don't know, 30 years ago from just re repetition, from practice, 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 practice. And, I, I, and I, I do not think about it in the slightest. It just, it does exactly what I want, what, what, what I'm thinking, the notes will just get picked out. I don't have to think about it in the slightest. I think that's key. And, and I wonder whether or not, in academia, you know, you, you kind of draw upon the books that you've read, you read them, you forget them, but there's, there's, the ideas are there somewhere that you, 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 you know, you interpolate certain ideas and you keep them, they become part of you, you reject other ones. It's definitely like that for martial artists. You know, the, you, you practice technique over and over and over again until you can forget it. You learn the technique and you forget the technique. Your pianist needs to practice the scales. You, 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 the fingers have to know what, they have to know what's there in order to forget what's there in order to, to then truly express themselves and and it's it's the same with martial arts it's the same with um definitely the style of guitar my experiences of, of doing what i do with that uh so it's the same in academia as well i think and you're right it's, it's definitely something which you you'll never hear mentioned once in a school i mean a lot of things aren't mentioned in schools aren't they i mean one of one that's always got me when i sort of reflect on my teaching my life as a as a teacher was was um you know you, i don't know i don't know if i ever heard what does it lead, mean to lead a good life <laughs> i don't think i ever heard that said once you know and you're dealing you're dealing really in a in a school full of younger people who have a life ahead of them the very idea of how how you should live your life in a way that's meaningful to you is never mentioned. Well, Richard, I've, I've thoroughly, as always, uh, in our conversations, I've thoroughly enjoyed this, and uh, I think anyone listening to this will will think, as we have, uh, about about education and schools and what you do teach and what we don't teach, and uh, maybe an alternative curriculum. So, Richard, Doctor. Thank you very much for being a guest this week. And that brings to an end another episode of the Friday Morning Break with John Gibbs. My guest this week was Dr. Richard Miller, blues guitarist, MMA coach and doctor of philosophy. 
we consider together some alternative ways of thinking about education and some alternative routes to learning. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, it'll be available now as a podcast on Spotify and lots of other platforms. Thank you for listening. to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.